Hello everybody, this is iSlime, or also known as the Anything Dude here, and today I'm going to teach you about how to use SSAO bias, strength, and radius to really make your shadows realistic and render out properly. Alright. So as you can see here in camera one, in my primary viewport on the left side, you can see that I have an engineer set up, and he's just kind of there, in his loser pose. It's nothing really that complicated, I didn't pose him or anything, I just gave him a quick sequence. But anyway, um, see my sequence there. Anyway. So what I want to do is I want to render out the shadows and make them look quite nice like they would in game. So, how do we do this? Well, first, to make sure you that your shadows are going to be rendered even at all, you're going to make sure that your depth of field is at least higher than 64. I'm going to render it at about 512. Also, the higher that it is, the longer it will take to render. So if you're doing a movie or something, you're probably only going to want to do 64 or 128. If you're doing wallpaper, you're probably going to do the highest. I'm doing 512 because I don't want it to take too long, but I want it to look good. I'm going to turn motion blur off simply because I'm not using it. Actually, you know what? I'm going to keep it on just to show. Let's keep this at 64. Make sure that ambient occlusion is on because that's the source of everything. The reason that this is here is that if you're working on a project, you're going to want to turn this off because it's trying to render it real time even though it shouldn't be because if it is, then it's just going to make your thing lag. So when you turn it off, as you can see, all these that grainy effect has just disappeared. And when I turn it on, it's there because that's actually your shadows. The thing about the shadows now is that they're not being rendered out properly and since all the render effects aren't on properly, they're not going to render out. Anyway, so let's continue. So if we go to the clip editor, it'll actually render out. As you can see, that looks pretty good, but there's a few things and details that you don't actually want to see. A good way to do this is using SSAO bias, SSAO strength, and SSAO radius. There are these three options here. Now, I'm going to bring up a web page. Down here, it says the three things that they do. So, SSAO bias determines the threshold for visible amount of ambient occlusion. Strength determines the intensity of the shadows cast by ambient occlusion. And radius determines the filter size or the spread of shadows being cast. That's a good way to say it, but for the most part, there's a lot of like presets. They're not actually in Source Filmmaker, but you can find how to recreate them online. I have my tone map and my bloom scale set a little bit higher, but really all I can say about that is tone map basically changes all the tones of the colors, and bloom just adds more shininess and more of a reflecting radius off something. Anyway, so I'm bias. I'm going to set it to about in the middle of the A and the S. On strength, I'm going to set it all the way to about this S. As you can see, it's not really matching the radius. So this is a good thing to filter around with. I'm not going to actually touch it that much. I'm just going to leave it about a little bit higher. Radius, I'm going to put about here. It's going to show a bigger spread on it. Anyway, as you can see, it is changed to here. And the way to go back and see how it's changed is to go to your clip editor. Shadows are a little bit more dynamic. Thing is, it's a little bit darker. That's a thing. Depending on how you want your shadows, it's really going to change how they're going to be affected. So I'm actually going to undo everything. Because I think everything was actually done pretty okay for what it was. It really matches our lighting in the room. I'm also going to want to talk about depth of field and how that works. So, 
If you see this option here, focal distance, you see that when you use it, well, sorry, you have to be in the timeline to edit any of these options, by the way, just to let you know. And if you want anything to render out, you have to be in the clip editor. Focal distance, as you see, if you edit it, it'll edit this purple thing. What is it, this exactly? Well, depending on where you put this square on this plane, it'll render out in the highest amount of precision wherever anything is intersecting with the square. As you can see, I put my engineer in the square. What controls the amount of depth of field is the aperture. It's not anywhere right now, but if you edit it, it will have the higher amount of blur. I'm going to put it around the R between the between the R and the T. So we go back to the clip editor. As you can see, it's a little bit blurrier, and the temp the engineer stands out a little bit more. I go back into the editor, just raise it slightly more. That one between the U. As you can see, the engineer really stands out. Go back to the timeline. To show how this is working, I'm going to put a spy in the background pretty quickly. Almost looks like he's sitting on his shoulders. Kind of funny. I'm going to put him in the background over here. Just going to simply rotate him. There we go. And I'm going to go to the clip editor. As you can see, the spy is kind of distorted. And you can't really see his eyes. You can't see his mouth detail. But you can't see the position he's in. Either way, it's a pretty good little trick to use bring some attention to something. Here, I'll show you bringing attention to the spy, but keeping it away from the engineer. So we select the camera again. I'm going to move the focal distance over to about where the spy would be. the spies around there. A good way to check is with these lines. The working lines, you can actually see where he is. The spies are right about at the peak. Let's keep it there. Let's bring the aperture down at about maybe in between the A and the P. This is only because if we keep the blur up higher, it's going to blur the front a little bit more than what we think we'd see. As you can see, the engineer is quite blurry, and we can see the spy quite clearly. Again, a very good trick to use. You can even animate focal distance and aperture. I'll do that very quickly. Alright, so the good way to do this is to select your focal distance. On the time you want to select. zoom into that. This is a spread of 20 seconds. Alright, the easiest way to do this is to take your focal distance, move it to where you want it, bring your aperture up like that. As you can see, nothing really renders, because you can't render this in real time. If you go in between, you can see how the blur renders. Showing this shows that it's going in between. And you can see it animating. Anyway, that's really all I wanted to show for this, is shadows and focal distance and aperture. And just a quick little thing to show how tone mount works. So if 
you see, tone map brings up your tones and darkens the tones. You can see, this is quite bright. You don't really want that. Unless there's a big explosion going off, I don't think you'd really want that. And gloom scale brings up the shininess of an object. Anyway, that's it for now. I'll see you guys later.